G'day, Coach Ray here. I'm a triathlon and marathon running coach who specialises in coaching beginner and recreational athletes to achieve their sporting as well as their health and fitness goals. In today's short video, I'm going to take you through return to exercise recommendations post COVID 19. The information in this presentation comes from the research of, excuse my pronunciations of these surnames, Halle, Reinsberger, and Schur uh, et al. Uh, who published their article, Exercise and, and Sport After COVID-19, Guidance from a Clinical Perspective, in the Translational Sports Medicine Journal uh, last year, 2021. So SARS-CoV-2, or COVID-19 as it's more commonly known, is predominantly a pulmonary disease. However, there's a potentially a multi-organ disease that causes a number of impacts on multiple organs across the body from the intestines, kidney, liver, brain, uh, vasculature, heart, as well as the obvious one being the lung, based on the fact that it's pulmonary disease predominantly. There's a range of different impacts it has on the different systems, from fibrosis in the lungs, pulmonary hypertension, and bronchial hyperresponsiveness in terms of impacting the... Um, the flow of air and oxygen into the lungs and then further around the, the body with its impacts on the heart, uh, the control of the blood getting pumped and transporting that oxygen through the nervous system as well as the flow through the vasculature through to the end locations, whether it's the muscles or uh, kidneys or other organs. So there's a range of different impacts that COVID-19 has on the body. Uh, and it needs to all be considered in any guidelines for any return to sport post COVID-19. One of the key things is how much uh, COVID has impacted people. Uh, the more common variant around at the moment, the Omicron one here in New Zealand, is um, tends to have a lot less impact than Delta or some of the earlier variants. So pre-exercise diagnosis, basically this was um, all written when published in early 2021 and knowledge of COVID-19 has grown further in the year and a bit since then. Initial recommendations are based on extrapolations from other virus-induced um, pathologies that have been around for many years. In fact, these recommendations uh, can also work for a number of other um, a virus or viral impacts on the body from a range of sources from the common cold, uh, particularly a severe common cold where a large amount of training time is lost as opposed to one or two days. This is based on an impact of multiple organ systems and for primarily patients that have ended up uh, in hospital, the, the more detailed information initially, but the guidelines at the end of the presentation are relevant for all athletes that have had to take um, multiple days or even longer than a week off any form of training. From a medical perspective, sound clinical examination is needed and severity of disease, age, as well as gender and post-disease exercise performance expectations need to be considered. So for athletes who have had um, a pulmonary diagnostics, a two-year follow-up for other SARS epidemics uh, needs to be considered. Impaired diffusion capacity, overall decreased exercise performance capacity, and confirmed by initial COVID-19 observations. Now, a lot of these aren't going to happen now that uh, particularly uh, New Zealand-based medical practice is just using the rapid antigen tests uh, and not going into a lot of diagnostic diagnostic uh, medical keeping. You do the rat test at home, you self-isolate for as long as is required. Uh, some people it's short as four or five days, other people it's 10 to 12 or even out past 15, depending on how it goes. So a lot of this isn't being done, um, but looking at static and dynamic lung function testing, vital capacity as well as forced expiration volumes, that's looking at how efficiently your, um, you can get air movement into the lungs or out of the lungs. 
Um, if proven pulmonary involvement or symptomatic athletes with persistent respiratory limitation, then they need to look at a bit more testing as well. Residual volume and total lung capacity via uh, body plethysmography, uh, which is basically a little bit more detailed than looking at the vital capacity and force expiration volumes by breathing uh, into a tube that feeds onto a pressure gauge that slides along depending on the volume. So a lot of this isn't going to be available for most people unless you're at the worst end of uh, the COVID implications. Furthering on the COVID side of things and the more detailed medical involvement is the impact on the cardiovascular system and the potential for inflammation of coronary um, endothelium as well as the myocardium, which is just the sacs uh, of body tissue that the heart is encapsulated in and making sure that there's no uh, further issues around that uh, with inflammation of that tissue. For high level, uh, particularly team sports, or for members of the population that have had a really bad uh, COVID experience and spent time in hospital, pre-exercise mandatory cardiovascular screening is recommended by the authors of the journal article, uh, including uh, arresting ECG, whether you're symptomatic or not, and an echocardiogram for those with previous or ongoing mild symptoms, or palpitations or dyspnea, uh, which are obviously uh, issues with the heart firing sequence. Uh, and that follows on with the abnormal resting uh, echocardiogram or ECG. When there's cardiopulmonary exercise diagnostics, so this is looking at things whilst exercising, um, need to look at how the cardiopulmonary system operates whilst maximal exercise. So it should include an ECG, uh, including oxygen saturation and monitoring that during exercise, uh, usually on a treadmill and a progressive or ramp test uh, to maximum. Looking at subclinical impairment or trying to detect uh, impairment in the cardiopulmonary system in a subclinical environment, looking at ar arrhythmias and also premature um, basically heartbeats out of water. Patients with severe symptoms and or post-pneumonia uh, or myocarditis, um, then we need to look at a blood gas analysis with a spiriogmetry. Those with muscular or neural, or there needs to be muscular and neurological testing uh, if there's the likelihood of a higher level neurological involvement, even if the case is only mild. Every patient should undergo a clinical neurological exam before return to exercise, um, looking at motor, sensory and coordination testing. Vertigo is an issue with a number of uh, patients of COVID and it needs to be evaluated carefully uh, by examining the vestibular system which are in the inner ear and are involved in balance. So that's for people in the worst case situations. Uh, looking at things a little bit more pragmatically, particularly in the New Zealand environment where a lot of people are catching COVID, going through the self-isolation without any uh, involvement with a registered medical practitioner, simply doing the rat at home, self-isolating and then returning to work or returning to normal. Um, but re jumping straight into exercise is not necessarily a good thing and trying to prevent long COVID um, by having an appropriate return to sport program is the key. So these are direct quotes from the article. Exercise training should be encouraged in all patients after discharge from hospital and after recovery from acute infection. Now that exercise needs to be appropriate. If you spend a time in hospital as a result of uh, COVID, then it needs to be appropriate. Going out and running a marathon on day one from release of hospital is never going to be appropriate. Uh, it's going to be a long, gradual process having been hospitalised. Uh, even self-isolating at home, running a marathon the next day is not recommended either. In addition to the clinical severity and time course, performance will be lost due to illness. 
not exactly rocket science, um, spending time doing nothing will lose some conditioning, but when you've had your body systems um, disrupted through a virus, then making sure that you build that training back appropriately uh, will take time because you won't be at the same level of performance you were when you came down with the illness. Recommendations regarding return to sport have been made based on analogies, as controlled studies are currently lacking. So there hasn't been enough time to do a lot of research uh, using humans as guinea pigs. So there isn't the um, controlled studies around with the exact answers. So these are all recommendations based on uh, cautious uh, and aligned with other viral um, adaptations and how your um, body tissues have been potentially impacted. It is unequivocal that exercise training has to be individually tailored in order to optimise the balance between strain and adaptation processes on the basis of disease, state and exercise performance. So just as with any exercise program, it needs to be tailored for the individual. Same with the return to sport. It needs to be tailored based on your level of performance. Getting two people, two different experiences pre-COVID, as well as having a different experience during COVID, telling them both to do a 30 minute run at six minutes per kilometre pace, um, it's not going to be practical. One of them may have been able to do it before COVID, uh, illness and one of them may not have been. It's not going to be appropriate. So it needs to be looked at the the total exercise prescription, the duration, the intensity, uh, the rest, the frequency, all needs to be looked at in an individual basis based on what they were doing beforehand, the duration and the severity of the disease. So the German Sports Medicine Association as well as the American College of Cardiologists Sport and Exercise Cardiology Council uh, both uh, quoted within the journal article. So um, full eligibility is determined by the recommended diagnostics and no structural damage remains. Athletes can gradually return to their specific training and to competitive activities. So once you've got a full bill of health post-COVID uh, with no structural damage as a result of the disease or anything else, you can slowly build your training back. The recommendation is two to three days of graded return for each day of training lost due to the illness. The example I often give, because it's about typical for most of my athletes I coach that have caught COVID, is 10 days of no training. It means we're going to take 20 to 30 days to build that training back up. The long duration is based on the recovery of the pulmonary tissue as well as the vascular vasculature is prolonged even if the virus load has resolved. So you might be feeling full health, but there's a lot of stuff internally that is slowly rebuilding uh, that is um, that you can't see or subjectively assess uh, yourself. So the training structure, we first look at building in the frequency. So if you exercise daily before COVID, we build back into that. Exercising daily for short durations and, and at low intensity is no drama. If you're exercising twice a day prior to COVID or twice a day, uh, three or four days a week and once a day on the remaining days, then jumping straight back to that amount of frequency is not going to be a good thing. So starting off daily and building in that second session towards the end of that first third um, of the re return to exercise process. We then build that duration, building that through the second third of the return to training duration or the, the time period and then finally we add intensity in that last third of the program. Whilst exercising it's important to monitor the heart rate, um, expect to see it elevated and at a higher um, heart rate during normal training and it will take a wee while for your aerobic fitness to rebuild to 100% and see the heart rate drop down to slightly lower levels or return down to the levels that you were at pre-COVID. It's not going to happen overnight. 
All right, any questions, feel free to add them as comments before I do get notifications of those comments and we'll get round to them. Um, or feel free to send me a direct email. Liking and sharing this video if you believe the content is of good value to people that may benefit from it. And also subscribe to Quick Kiwi Coaching for further videos. You can see them up on the screen now, some that may be of benefit to you. Thank you.